thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for for uh, uh, being uh, uh, here and being on this panel. I'm very happy to have been able to to join in on 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 this on this conference, and it's always it's always so so. Um, uh, bracing and so encouraging to have this collaboration with uh, the Institute of Mediterranean Studies. Uh, okay, I, I will be speaking about memoir, and uh, and uh, particularly uh, the the recent work of memory from uh, Cypriot author uh, Stefanos Stefanidis. Uh, but I will obviously be framing it within the politics of Southern Europe. Um, uh, and the Central Eastern Mediterranean, and I hope you'll find this interesting. It's just um, really skimming over the discourse, uh, but obviously I'd be very happy to to take any questions and elaborate on the content and discourse of this memoir um, during the, the question time. In a recent piece on the state of European liberalism today, uh, Sebastian Malaby takes the opportunity to remind us that the principle that there is more wisdom that there is more to wisdom than principles remains a vital one. Today, the need to rethink Southern Europe at a time when its borders are being queried culturally and politically is, I think, a vital one. Conversations about a wisdom that may overcome the political grammar that is today increasingly orphaned of its objectives uh, is always a difficult matter to broach, but one that is well overdue. The space of excess that is increasingly expanding between a political wisdom that seems to be eluding us at this very moment and the need for liberal politics now to reassert what it stands for uh, is what I'd, likely to, uh, what I'd like to briefly open up uh, also by looking at Stefanos Stefanidis' recent work. In an appraisal of mainstream European politics today, Alina Polyatsova and Benjamin Haddad advised that I quote, rather than giving in to nostalgia, European leaders today should start with an honest assessment of the path that has led them to the current crisis. Legitimately, today we worry about the lack of people's faith in the fourth estate, the erosion of public discourse, the rise of populism, and as Jeffrey Tucker has noted, the evident failure of the European wide political union to meet the needs of the people, very bluntly put. Meanwhile, we are experiencing large-scale unemployment, precarious jobs, a deterioration in state-provided health care and welfare. These have become the new normal in various European member states. Uh, the situation obviously complicates uh, in relation to issues of regular, of, of, uh, uh, regular migration and of hospitality towards asylum seekers. Um, and there is increasing, unfortunately, uh, increasing hostility uh, uh, across many member states in Europe towards uh, people uh, seeking asylum from difficult uh, political and economic scenarios. Obviously, the situation uh, has been exacerbated by the COVID uh, pandemic, but the anxiety about uh, a liberal lapse, a lapse in liberal politics, a crisis in liberal politics was already highlighted by Jacques Derrida uh, 25 years ago in an essay which eventually became a book titled The Other Heading, an essay on Europe, fundamentally on the political status of the European Union uh, post uh, uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain. So this was penned at the cusp, Derrida was writing at the cusp of the Soviet demise, uh, the escalating conflict in the Balkans, and his piece back then betrays a profound anxiety with the directions of liberal democracy and with the promise of the post-Cold War manifesto for Europe. Speaking from what he calls the somewhat weary feeling of an old European, Jacques Derrida draws attention uh, to the aging political psyche of the relatively young, uh, at that point, European bloc. And Derrida writes, he writes that, I quote, we are already exhausted uh, as Europeans, as young old Europeans, as he puts it. This axiom of finitude is a swarm of questions. From what state of exhaustion must the young old Europeans who we are set out again re-embark Derrida's admission to this sense of political finitude is also pregnant with a sense of, of, of overrun, of what Derrida calls débordement, um, 
uh, with, 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 with a concern with edges and with the edges of the continent. And obviously this is where Stefano Stefanidis work comes in. But uh, Derrida's concern is as much uh, with the fundamental questions that liberal politics in Europe should be asking is, uh, itself, as well as with the creative and regenerative potential of Europe's edges. And the questions he maps out in that piece suggest a sense of the risk that the liberal mainstream in Europe reverses into some kind of solipsism, and a solipsism that becomes uh, paralyzing, as it were. And obviously, we know uh, what happened uh, over uh, the 20, 25 years following uh, Derrida's thoughts. Uh, and Derrida raises the question of memory and the question of the crisis of memory as an important way of revising ourselves uh, and revising uh, our, liberal our, our liberal outlook on the, on the continent. And Derrida asks, among the many questions that he raises in that piece about the, the crisis of the political soul in post-Soviet uh, Europe, uh, in, in Europe and in living also uh, the, the post-Soviet period, uh, and Derrida asks, among other questions, for what cultural identity must Europe be responsible? And responsible before whom? Before what memory should Europe be responsible? For what promise should Europe be responsible? It seems to me that those questions persist today in the form of ever-increasing chasms. Uh, or in commensurate relations today between Europe's long-standing rhetoric about itself, about its supranational uh, sense of relation, about its being, its project, uh, since the uh, end of the Cold War period. And Derrida was gesturing in a fledgling way, in an embryonic way, but one can sense in this, in this piece that Derrida was gesturing towards a material politics of, or praxis of social implementation. Um, what, what, what point does memory serve at the end of the day, if not somehow to uh, also attune us to our social contingencies, to our social urgencies? Uh, before what memory must Europe hold itself responsible today if it wants to do justice by its structural otherness? And that includes uh, all forms of uh, communal, uh, even if minoritarian um, uh, uh, sectors that, that constitute the European continent. And, and Derrida raises this, this, this question um, in terms of the way in which Europe fences itself off, in which Europe defends, defends itself from perhaps uncomfortable notions of the other and of what the other should constitute. But it is through this notion of our answerability in front of the structural otherness that I would like to enter the discourse of Stefanos Stefanidis' work, because Derrida is also su suggesting, in essence, that the way we can revise ourselves as Europeans uh, is by beginning to uh, convene around a discourse of the South and around a discourse that emanates profoundly from the post-colonial edges of the continent. And Stefano Stefanidis' work, I think, intervenes right at this moment when the need to deploy memory, the need to, to mobilize memory as a political tool to revise ourselves uh, from the active edges of the continent. Um, and Stefanidis comes up with a work of memory. Uh, he published it only about uh, a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, it's a fluid lyrical work and it's, it's titled The Wind Under My Lips. It was published by an Athenian uh, publisher, uh, written originally in English and translated into Greek. And it's a fluid lyrical work that evokes Stefanidis' journey between worlds, between political events, between geographic realities of the Mediterranean and, and beyond it. But also, uh, it fundamentally outlines a relation between motion, between uh, motion across geographies, and what are often reveries of contemplation, of inspired contemplation, of precisely a mobilization of, of memory. Uh, Stefanides is loath to mention his native island by name, 
he's writing about Cyprus and never uh, actually uh, mentions the word Cyprus. But this is a narrative of flux, uh, of a serendipitous sense of errors. It is a work that charts the author's childhood, youth, and later episodes in life by means of narrative sequences and clusters of poetry that alternate and interlace into each other. The book, the book situates Stefanidis' account in the tumultuous events of the second half of the 1950s in Cyprus that saw an armed revolt against British colonial rule intended towards enosis or union with Greece, as well as large-scale civil disobedience. The second important date around which the account is built is 1974, the years in which, among other events, uh, as Stephanides notes, Archbishop Macarius, the president, was overthrown in a coup organized by the ultra-right Yoka B, uh, backed by the Greek junta, and in response, Turkey invaded and occupied an area of the island uh, around Kyrenia on the northern Cypriot coast. As events unfolded, in Cyprus, Stephanides, then uh, a young student uh, uh, pursuing doctoral studies in Cardiff, uh, left for Portugal, uh, or as he words it, in 1974, I quote him, my revolutionary spirit drove me towards uh, Olissibona, uh, towards Lisbon, on a quest to experience the Carnation Revolution in Portugal at first hand. In many ways, Stephanides' work shares an interrogative structure uh, with Derrida in relation to the so-called young old Europe of the period and after it. Stephanides himself, not always sure what it means to be old or to be young, as he writes, seems to be caught up in this back and forth between this historic burden uh, that the continent and that the European bloc carries and the primacy of a youth uh, that uh, is participating in the conflict that marks his native island and in the Portuguese uh, revolution. And Stevanides writes the following, I am not sure if it was death or coma. Whatever it was, I sense it's Überleben claiming me. A metempsychosis that has spread here and everywhere, dark and sticky, surreptitious like a virus. I am in need of a methodology to trace it. I tentatively explore houses and habitats. I turn over stones and tombstones, smell it out, touching its mild dew at my fingertips. The sibyls murmur to me before dawn with their contradictory voices. Embedded in these terms of memory from one of Europe's unrequited Mediterranean fronts is a labor of narration that will not settle for the aging of the European, uh, of the European uh, uh, post-war uh, idea of itself, but neither does it settle for the standard conventions of what we understand by memory writing and by memoir. Uh, why? Because Stephanides is a work of memory uh, that features a wandering persona, a pretty enigmatic uh, errant persona. However, it's a persona that is also very socially attuned and connected. And in between this sense of reverie, of contemplation and social connection, in that tension, uh, Stephanides enacts a form of memory that speaks from the edges, from the troubled frontiers of the continent. Stephanides, uh, when I spoke to him about this work, he was very skeptical of uh, speaking of it as a memoir. Uh, and I understand this uh, because the fortunes and meaning of the memoir form uh, and of the way in which uh, memory is mobilized uh, come to be rephrased and expanded in their meaning as one reads the memoir. I raise this point because it seems to me that the work of memory in Stefano Stefanides' work is, is precisely that, it's a labor of memory. Okay? The idea of memoir, uh, as we know it generically, may no longer be contained within the brief demanded by certain expectations that we were familiar with. Uh, this is a book that opens up uh, the idea of memory in order to give it the stature of a praxis, of a labor, and hence going back to the question raised by Derrida uh, of memory as a form of responsibility. Uh, and this is precisely, I feel, what Stefanides is enacting here. One may begin to speak, therefore, of memoir not only as a noun, 
denoting, denoting a form. But in Stephanie, this memoiring becomes almost a verb, right? A, a verb that connotes a range of memorial actions, dynamics, and practices. And we might, therefore, as we read Stephanie, begin to make the shift from memoir to uh, the notion of to memoir. Uh, to memoir as a verb, in the way we speak of to play or to move or to dance, to memoir. Um, what would this verb entail? Uh, it is not merely a dialectic of acts of recall, um, politics and history, but uh, it is a very porous uh, form of narrating memory uh, in which memory becomes a social political actor already in Stefanidis' confession to being overwhelmed by the historic events in his country, we sense a voice whose arc of narration exceeds the mere motive of narrating one's life and begins to do something, something else. Stefanidis' work of memory holds itself to account on the wisdom that the answer to the principal question of who I am as Anna Arendt argues, can never be given by myself, but only by the many others I interact with. That was Anna Arendt. And this is a way um, in Stefanides' work of mobilizing memory through interaction, through the interaction of voices across times, across historical periods. Uh, voices that are very recent begin to relate to voices that the author revives and remembers from the 1950s, from the 1970s. And what you begin to get is this continuum of voices speaking to each other across uh, the Cypriots and across the Southern European uh, post-colonial history, I would say. Uh, one senses the affinity uh, in this dynamic that Stefanides suggests between uh, a certain idea of doing politics, a certain understanding of political freedom, and the ability to recall one's life and to maximize the experience of memory, to maximize the experience of recall, um, including through the idea of childhood self-awareness. The memoir speaks about Stefanidi's childhood in the 1950s and he has very vivid recollections of himself, of children he used to play with, uh, of a very sort of uh, cosmopolitan um, uh, Cypriot community and he does not simply narrate it to us, he does not simply um, it does not simply give us a picture of what was happening back then, but he presents a very vivid, um, almost epiphany that pervades the political present. And, uh, and in its evocation of, I quote, the voices and accents of hoodlums from Piraeus, the rustic speech of villagers, the pompous English rulers speaking Greek, uh, he immediately shifts us in a memorial terrain that, uh, that, that, that induces us to, to rethink the crisis of the present and to, to, to think to ourselves, but how come, um, how come the politics of the present has become, for instance, so, so pervasively xenophobic? Um, but these are matters for, for question time as well, and we can open, open them later. Um, have I got five minutes? Hello? Can you hear me? Have I got five minutes? Yeah, okay. Yeah. The readiness to open up one's story as a proxy, therefore, to these clamoring social political pasts is a path for Stephanides to achieve action outside and away from the trappings of a bland or facile nostalgia. And what Stephanides is doing here is precisely to open up his own life story uh, in a vicarious way and vicarious narration as in narration as proxy. Uh, for Stefanidis becomes a way of avoiding uh, any, any simplistic or facile nostalgia. And what you sense constantly as he's narrating the 50s, the 60s, the 70s in Cyprus, in Portugal, um, in, in England, uh, you begin to sense that uh, there is never a lapse into facile nostalgia. And the reason why that is so is because Stefanidis manages to uh, manages the porosity 
of his memorial writing. It becomes very permeable. Um, the way he allows voices to speak through him, as it were. Uh, the way in which his narrative becomes uh, almost a selfless proxy uh, for these voices to intervene into the present um, is a way of narrating the past without um, the solipsistic sense of of a time past uh, or of lamenting a time past, but rather um, transforming that lament into an active political responsibility into the present. Uh, and an important question arises here in relation to the mandate of memory itself. How does the mandate to memoir revalue the act of recall such that this comes to host those very obligations before whom we ought to be responsible, before whom we ought to approach our responsibility in the region of the world we live in. This question bears heavily on how forms of political conscience may enter or exit the Mediterranean world through the hospitability of memorial writing, or indeed the lack of it. The Wind Under My Lips is a book that is held together through the transcultural crossings of a roving or wandering voice, but one that is no less politically assertive for it. What we as readers are invited to do is to enact a shift in what Tristan Garcia would term the criterion focused on manner, to seek, that is, not only what discourse is the voice asserting or pitching as morally feasible, but to what extent uh, that which intensely fulfills our being is a work of responsibility. And here I'd like to quote Stephanides uh, before, uh, before uh, wrapping up, uh, because he, an exposure to, to, to the way he's narrating his memories we all, will go a long way in illustrating this. I still want to see my grandmother Elengu, Stephanides writes, even though Tricomo, my native village, was now under Turkish occupation and we could not uh, cross the sea's fire line. Elengu would probably not remember you. She's mostly living in the 1930s. She'll think you are your grandfather Stephanos arriving from Alexandria. I didn't want to believe she would not remember me. Senility had set in, he said, and she did not even remember there was a war and that the island was now divided. She lived with Theophedias in the village of Engomi, where they had taken her after the July coup. When left alone, she would set off to go back to Tricomo on foot until the police would find her and bring her back to Engomi. Such, passage, such passages in Stephanides raise the question of towards which memorial brief ought we to feel committed, ought we to feel committed to narrate as proxies to the past. There is, of course, no one answer to the question. However, what Stephanides does, um, what Stephanides does is, is to allow us as readers these, these emotional breaking points. In this case, uh, his grandmother uh, is suffering from a memorial, uh, from a memorial lapse, from a memorial condition um, uh, in which she is um, almost automatically, almost unwittingly, when taken out of her native village, she's trying to walk back to her native village that now belongs uh, to uh, another, uh, belongs across another political frontier. And there are these, um, these, these soul-breaking moments um, uh, across his work uh, that open up, open up the world of, of these individuals uh, for us. Uh, if I had time, um, I would move into uh, a matter that was very dear to Anna Arendt and her view of politics, which is the question of doxa. And by doxa, Arendt uh, understands the ways in which um, the ways in which the world opens up to the individual, and the assumption that the world is different to every individual according to their position in it, and that within within that difference to how the world opens up individually, one then can extrapolate uh, uh, the common good uh, and the residence of the common good. Uh, in, conclusion, in conclusion, 
to memoir marks an important political effort to achieve one's story as a proxy for those other threshold moments, those other threshold zones of experience where the world as it opens itself to the individual, as it appears to the individual, are actively seen to interpolate uh, the, the, the social. And in this sense, we begin to move towards uh, a memorial reading of liberal individualism that Stefanidis um, interlaces with, um, with, the poetic, with the poetic experience. Perhaps from that tension between the poetic contemplative experience and the intervention uh, into the social through memory, uh, something more uh, politically powerful and relevant to our moment may emerge. I will stop there, uh, but then I'd be happy to take questions uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much.